Greetings, PsyQ community. Rachel Self here from Otsuka Neuroscience Medical Affairs. I'm talking with Dr. John Grant, JDMD from University of Chicago, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neuroscience. Thank you so much, Dr. Grant, for sharing some of your time and expertise, as well as clinical insights with our PsyQ community today. We appreciate that. You're very welcome. So let's kick it off with getting to know you a little bit better. Okay. You have a very interesting and impressive background where you've obtained advanced degrees in both law as well as medicine. Can you share with us what made you decide to pursue both of these fields and how you see them potentially complementing or playing off of one another throughout your career? Yeah, I, I actually pursued law first um, and I was very fascinated by trying just to understand the law. Um, I don't know that we do a good job of actually teaching the law, even though it impacts everyone. And so I wanted to learn about it. Um, and actually, it, it really developed an interest for me in human psychology, because that's what the law is. And so that then sort of sparked my interest in, in human psychology and made me want to go to medical school, interestingly enough, as a better avenue to really understand human beings. I do think, however, that they, they interplay with each other quite a lot. And, and I don't, I'm not a lawyer to my patients by any means, but patients, one, on a very practical level, often have the legal system that they have to understand. And to give some kind of civics le lection or lecture about uh, the legal process becomes really important. So substance abusing patients get involved with the law. Impulsive patients often have legal problems with the law. Um, and so I think all of that becomes relevant. But also, on the flip side, people who are caught up in the criminal justice system often have mental health problems. And they need someone often to actually help understand that and to uh, actually be able to explain it to the courts and to the uh, uh, lawyers involved. So. I think it's actually always relevant, and I'm amazed how it comes up more often than I would expect. I, I think you make a really great point there. It's hard to escape uh, legal matters or mental health matters, whether you're experiencing them yourself or family, friends, loved yes. ones. So, and you actually gave me the perfect segue for my next question. Okay. So with your vast expertise in impulse control behaviors, what do you see as the greatest challenges for the clinician in our current state of psychiatry, treating impulse control behaviors? And where do you see research and clinical practice moving maybe in the next five to 10 years with respect to this patient population? So I think it's, there are a couple aspects that make it difficult. I think clinicians are um, busy. They have uh, too little time often to spend with their patients. And impulse problems often come out very slowly and over time. Some of the impulsive problems that people engage in, whether it's stealing, sexual impulsivity, etc., are very embarrassing for patients. So they really need trust in their clinicians, and that means more time that clinicians need to spend with their patients, and to do that longitudinally, so that the person can actually discuss some of these more troubling behaviors. I think from the research perspective and the clinical though, is that when people are sort of left then with a person who has these impulsive problems, we don't have great algorithms in terms of how best to approach them. Should we do psychotherapy first? Should we do medications with psychotherapy? What's the best approach to many of these problems? We simply don't have enough research in many of the impulsive behaviors to actually be able to sort of tell clinicians with a great degree of certainty, listen, this is the first approach, this is the second approach. And so I'm hoping that research will pay attention to a vast array of impulsive behaviors um, to further that along so that clinicians then will want to ask because if they think that they have an approach to offer the patient, they're more likely to ask about the problems to, uh, to start with as well. So. I think it's got to work in tandem. People have to start being more receptive to asking about potentially very sensitive topics, but also the research world has to do more to help clinicians address it. Right, so if you uncover some of these types of impulse control behaviors, you have that information, but then what do you do with it? Exactly. What's the algorithm to follow? Exactly. Great. So digging a little bit deeper into a more specific type of um, psychiatric diagnosis, I recently had the pleasure of seeing you speak on obsessive compulsive disorder. And you mentioned some of the challenges with this patient population, especially with those that maybe have more taboo sorts of delusions or obsessions. 
Um, could you speak a little bit more about this for our psyche community? I appreciate the question. And so, you know, a lot of people think OCD is all just about germs and then hand washing. And there are literally dozens of types of OCD. And so about one in five or one in four folks with OCD have what are called taboo obsessions. And these often are under the umbrella of sexual uh, themes, uh, violent themes, or sacrilegious themes. So imagine, you know, you're somebody who, you know, you're 18, 19, and you have constant images of uh, uh, sexually repugnant thoughts that are constantly bombarding you, that you're not enjoying. These are not uh, what we call egocentonic. I mean, the, the person's very troubled by these. Um, and so they don't know what it is. They hear on television, OCD is about germs, so they don't even think that they have OCD. Clinicians are not particularly good at screening for all types of OCD. In part, it's a bit labor intensive, but many clinicians believe also that OCD is about germs and hand washing. And so people will live with this horrible sense of guilt and, and this really distressing feeling that they are truly bad or evil people for having pedophilic obsessions, um, violent obsessions that seem just really outrageously um, sort of movie-esque in terms of, of the sort of horrific images that people will have. And they simply don't talk about it um, because they're worried that a clinician may uh, think of them as a horrible person, call the police, take away their children, etc. So there's just a lack of information on both sides. Uh, for people who are struggling with it as well as clinicians. I do find, however, that when people are asked about them, you can see instantaneously this amazing sense of relief that somehow, okay, this is not just my character. This is, in fact, a psychiatric problem that my doctor is asking about. And that psychoeducation, as it's called, just explaining that to people can make a huge difference because these people are sometimes the most suicidal, the most likely to sort of do other unhealthy things to sort of uh, hide those thoughts such as drinking heavily, etc. cetera. Um, and so that sense of relief that people get can be life-giving just by screening for it. And to your point, you know, just some of the shame attenuation that probably goes along with that, knowing that they're not the only ones who've had yes. those types of thoughts. So. It is so, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's, I remember an example of a, of a new mother who had her OCD worsened postpartum, and she kept having these horrific images of doing something sexual to her child. She thought she was a horrible mother. She wanted to kill herself. She thought she was better off leaving the child uh, motherless. Um, and as I described that this was a form of OCD to her, she was just in tears, but so thankful and was rejuvenated to get, you know, to have the appropriate help for OCD, but was able to go home and realize that she wasn't a bad person, she wasn't a bad mother, and that the world wasn't hopeless. And if, if anything, that's what we're supposed to do in mental health, is to sort of try to make people's lives better. And it's really a testimonial to the power of just knowledge and education around a disorder. Absolutely, and that, that I'm sure was life-changing for her Incredibly. and for her family. Yep, and now many months later she's doing great and loves her child and they're having a wonderful life, so that's what it's all about. That's fantastic, and again, you've given me the perfect segue for my okay. next question, uh, because one of the things throughout our previous conversations and definitely seeing you speak publicly, your passion and your dedication to your patients is inspiring and infectious. Um, you mentioned that in some of your cases, particularly with patients who have OCD, that often you'll still make house calls for them if, um, if they're unable to make it to the clinic. With our growing utilization and reliance on technology, I'm just curious to see how you feel that technology might play a role, um, perhaps in you know, Skype treatment for some of these patients. And how would you see maybe being able to utilize technology to either benefit or do you see ways that it might hinder uh, some of these types of treatment options? I think it's a great question and I don't know that mental health is using Skype technology or you know, telepsychiatry as much as it could. Um, there are many people, not just OCD patients who are homebound, agoraphobic folks, um, uh, people with severe, other, uh, severe anxiety problems, even dementing illnesses, etc., are homebound. And so what can, 
how can we access, uh, how can they access care and we deliver care to these folks. Families sometimes, you know, they try to get their loved one out to a doctor, but they can't. Um, I have historically, um, some folks who've done this, done house calls, I found it very rewarding, incredibly time consuming as one imagines, but uh, very rewarding in terms of understanding what the person is like and actually understanding what they're, what they're really like in their home environment, which is something that we tend to sort of lack uh, awareness of when people come to the office. I think telepsychiatry, you know, still working out the ethical and quite frankly, the legal kinks of what's it mean perhaps never to actually meet a patient in person. You know, what does that mean, you know, for, to the clinician? And how far away can they be? Can they cross state lines? And all of these kind of questions. But I think for people who are homebound, um, delivering psychotherapy particularly can be very useful doing it via telepsychiatry to the point that I, I know people who've done that and they can actually work on, say, cognitive behavior therapy with people and actually get them out of the house then to actually be able to come to the office. Are there downsides? Yeah, maybe, I think prescribing medications, you know, um, you know, I think it's just contrary to how doctors have historically done it. We like to see our patient because you can tell a lot about other physical issues that they may have, the way they walk, you know, various uh, body language issues that may be relevant. You may want to get blood work on them. All of that is somewhat limited by just thinking of telepsychiatry. So whether it has to be all or nothing, maybe not. Maybe what people do is engage somebody and, and start the process, and then as they are getting somewhat better and able to leave the home, then they can come in and have blood work or physical exams, et cetera, that might be necessary before prescribing medication. So I think it's still a kind of a work in progress. I think it can be, though, incredibly useful, particularly for, for people who have a range of anxiety disorders um, that often mean that they just, I mean, it's terrifying for people to leave their home. And I think that clinicians need to be aware of that. Patients will have the best intentions. They call, they make appointments, and they then cancel, they cancel, they cancel. And we can sort of see that in a, in a negative way, but if we really try to get into the, a more sort of empathetic understanding, how hard it is for that person to even turn the doorknob and open their door can be actually devastating to the person. So they're trying their hardest, but sometimes they just don't have the skills to actually make it to an appointment. So, Yeah, that's a great point. So that'd be a good way to hopefully harness our technological yes. possibilities in the future. Yeah. So the final question I'd like to ask you today, and hopefully we can do this again because I, I always learn so much, talking with you, you have chosen to tackle what many in um, psychiatry and even outside of psychiatry for that matter, consider to be some of the most difficult to treat patient populations. You know, we've mentioned the impulse control, uh, borderline personality disorder, OCD, we've been talking about eating disorders, you know, agoraphobia. What types of clinical pearls or key learnings would you be able to share with our psych -U community about successfully treating um, some of these patient populations that a lot of other clinicians just honestly sometimes shy away from? Well, I think a couple things. I, I'm, you know, I wonder why, you know, there's a lot of misinformation, but right? why do people shy away from some of these patients? Some of them can be, come with their own legal and, you know, other sort of baggage, so to speak, right? They, they might be court ordered. Some of the impulsive patients have a sort of a, a sort of pending problems that I think can scare clinicians away. I would sort of say I wouldn't be scared. I've never found that to be uh, a hurdle really, you know, unlike any other patient population. I also think that the sort of these patients that are often ignored and aren't necessarily neat and tidy, so to speak, and, and all of their, are very appreciative of care. And so I think clinicians can actually find it very rewarding to take on some of the more sort of challenging uh, folks with either their behaviors or their personalities, et cetera, because I really think that the patients really value that respect that's given to them. They know that some of the things that they say can be very put offish and that, that other clinicians may have run from them, right, and, and don't want to sort of address their problems. And, and, but I think that when all is said and done, 
you know, these are, you know, I, I think of it as all the behaviors along a continuum. I mean, impulsive patients don't do anything that we all don't do. They might just be un, more unable to sort of control how much they do. And so if we sort of find sort of common humanity, I think that helps. And it helps to breed that sort of respect that we need to give them. And then I find it, I would think any clinician would find it incredibly rewarding uh, to work with these patients. I think the, as I mentioned before, I think one of the difficulties is again, unlike depression, um, for example, or bipolar disorder, which are two areas of mental health that have done beautiful jobs in understanding really detailed approaches first line treatments, second line treatments, etc., that these other behaviors sometimes don't have that. OCD does, but many of the impulsive obviously do not. And so I think that that's more unnerving. And I guess I would reframe that as, I think for clinicians who um, are willing to sort of engage neuroscience and be creative, it can be very rewarding intellectually as well because the treatment algorithms aren't so pat that you feel like I have to do step one, then two, then three. If you come to it with a, uh, an awareness of what may be going on psychologically, developmentally, neurochemically, that you can actually be quite creative in terms of what you do for patients. And I think that can just be professionally rewarding as well. Great, yeah, those are wonderful points. It's probably a little bit more uncharted waters, yes. but it doesn't mean that you can't make a lot of headway and, and have life-changing experiences, which yes. I know you've, you've seen quite yeah, a bit. Very much so. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking time to share some of your thoughts and expertise oh. with, with us today in our Absolute, PsychU community. Absolutely my pleasure, thank you. We really appreciate it. So hopefully we can chat again sometime I soon. I would love to, <laughs> I would love to. Thank, thank you. you.